Good luck, everyone. And we're starting. Okay. Good we morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fifth annual Toro Hack Conference. This conference is hosted by California State University, Dominguez Hills. This is the fifth year that we have this great conference. It started with a small cybersecurity competition event, and now it has become, as I'm told, one of the premier events in cybersecurity for students. It began to be just for CSUDH students. Later, it became statewide, and now it is a nationwide event. This conference is, is fully student-driven, and obviously, it is the first year to be fully virtual. And this year, the conference is led by two CSUG students, Mr. Mohammed el Sheb and Mr. Michael Van Cleve, uh, Cleve uh, Lopez. I also like to thank the whole team working on this event, including the volunteers, computer science department, CASI, Computing Alliance of Hispanic Serving Institutions, College of International and Extended Education, and at, uh, last but not the least, our sponsors. I also like to thank uh, Mr. Bob Kalko, is going to be the keynote speaker for this program. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Basti. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed Shiab. I am the co-president of the Cybersecurity Club. Hello, my name is Michael Vanco Lopez, and I'm also co-president of the Cybersecurity Club. <laughs> and we are so happy to have all of you join us today. We have a lot of fun activities and presentations planned. On behalf of the Tor Hack 5.0 committee, we would like to thank our volunteers, computer science department, faculty members, and express our sincere gratitude to our wonderful speakers. This event would not have been possible without everyone's help. So thank you, everyone. And today we have a very special guest. He is vice president of IBM Security Business Unit and has been with IBM for about 30 years. So let's give a virtual round of applause and a warm welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker, Mr. Bob Kalka. Thanks so much, everybody. It's great, great, great to be here with you from uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, I grew up in the Northeast. Uh, but I moved to Austin about 25 years ago because besides a cyber exec, I'm also a musician. And uh, of course, along with LA, it's uh, one of the great places to live if you're a musician. So um, what I'm going to do is spend some time with you and, and walk through uh, uh, perspectives on careers in cyber. Um, I, uh, as, as was said, I have been with IBM actually almost 32 years. Uh, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology in New York uh, for undergrad in computer science. Um, and then I, while I started working, I started working at IBM in 1989, that's scary to say. And I started out as an assembler developer and because uh, I was really into the low, low level stuff. I remember getting disgusted by what the code at compilers would crank out. So I started out writing uh, assembler code and uh, at night started going for an MBA um, at Syracuse because I was still in upstate New York. And so I have a, an MBA in, in small group psychology. <laughs> and if it sounds weird to have an MBA in small group psychology, if you work in cybersecurity for long, you won't be surprised at all. <laughs> because one of the most amazing things that you see in cyber is that you will walk into organizations all the time that actually know what the right thing to do is organizationally, but they don't do it. Um, hence, all of the hacks that we have to this day for really dumb reasons, like, oh, this device wasn't reconfigured when there was a change, so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll get into that as I go through my comments. Um, but so I found that understanding both the technology of cyber as well as the people side of it, Right, or, or why do people do um, smart things and why do people do dumb things um, is really relevant uh, to cybersecurity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through my observations because of my th almost 32 years at IBM, I have been doing cyber here for 27 years. So I was one of the first 12 people at IBM to focus on distributed security in 1994. Um, fell in love with it immediately. And I, I didn't realize till years later why, um, is that I actually come from a family uh, of, of people that were really into law enforcement. Uh, so my dad was a cop. Uh, my little brother spent 17 years on New Orleans police um, investigating sex crimes and homicides. 
including he had been there three years when Katrina hit. So he was in the middle of that. And if you want any stories, contact me offline. Anybody who hits on here, you can contact me offline. And I got great stories on that one. But anyways, and then after 17 years on the New Orleans Police Department, uh, he decided to try something new. And so for the last five years, my little brother has been the lead investigator for the Cook County Medical Examiner in Chicago, translated my little brother is a lead murder investigator in Chicago. <laughs> so uh, when he and I talk, inevitably at some point in the conversation, he'll uh, make some snarky comment to me that I chose the part of, of the security world that actually pays pretty well. Because <laughs> one, one of the things you learn in cybersecurity very quickly um, is that uh, not only is it an exciting bleeding edge, on the edge every day career, um, but it also pays really, really well. Um, and, and because of that, actually, there's a lot of people that jump into cyber that actually don't really have a lot of skills. They just want to go for the money, but you can pick out those folks pretty quickly. Um, so what I want to go through is the things that I've learned over 27 years of cyber and almost 32 years of a, of a professional career in tech. Um, of what really matters. So a uh, final point of sort of introduction here is that um, when I hit, um, when, when COVID hit last year, um, I had just hit 10.8 million air miles with American Airlines. I tell you that just to show you that I have literally spent my career on the road, flying all over the globe, meeting with clients of every size and every nook and cranny and every industry and everything else. Um, as I, I, I've been around, I've spent about 120 days a year on the road for 25 years. Um, and last year was weird, but actually a lot of fun. Fortunately, my wife and I realized we actually like being around each other more. So that's a good problem to have. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, and in fact, I had my first flights in 13 months earlier this week for a board meeting, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, it was pretty weird, uh, to travel. And it was funny because America, the stewardess for American airlines handed me a bottle of wine, said, thanks for rejoining us after 13 months. So that's a little creepy. That must be tracking us. But, um, but anyways, I, I digress, but I, so I've been on the road forever. Um, and so I want to uh, kind of dive into, uh, different careers in cyber and what I've learned are kind of the cardinal rules of having a successful career. So before I go on and dive into that, let me uh, ask the organizers, uh, is it okay to go or do we want to have um, uh, anyone else kind of give us any kind of intro? We're, we're good to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Super cool. All right, so uh, so in thir almost 32 years, um, I've had five careers in IBM, five completely different careers. And whether you have five different careers in five companies or in the same company, I just want you to see that this is possible. So I started out as an assembler developer and uh, I was writing code in the Microsoft Land Manager kernel to the, to the infamous SMB protocol um, uh, that allowed mainframes and local area net servers to connect and work with each other seamlessly. And I loved it. And my first day, June 19th, 1989, I still remember it in Endicott, New York. Um, I said to my boss two things, and you'll see a, a bizarre dichotomy between these two questions. First thing I said is, hey, um, you know, I uh, love writing code. I don't really like talking to people a whole lot. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to write code behind a locked door for 30 years and in 30 years, put a check under the door. I literally said that to him because um, I could talk. I could like be in front of people if I had a guitar in front of me because I've been playing clubs since I was 16. But if it was me talking about work stuff, I was like, Ugh, and I was terrified of it. Um, and so I said, lock me behind a door and then, you know, put a check under after 30 years. When I hit 30 years and I wasn't ready to retire, I thought that was kind of humorous. Um, the other, the other thing I said to my boss is, you know, um, but I'm, I, I don't like to talk to people, but I'm really ambitious. 
And so I came for, in IBM, you have different salary bands and the highest band you can be without being an executive is called a band 10. And I started out as a band four junior associate programmer. And so second question of my boss is how fast can I make band 10? And he just looked at me and laughed, right? Like, oh gosh, look at this ambitious geek. Um, and he laughed and said, look, if you're lucky and you get on the right projects and you're really, really good, you got to have all three of those right projects. You're really good. And you're really, really lucky. He said, maybe 10 years. I said, all right, I'm going to beat that. And by the way, I made it an eight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I was like very, very hyper ambitious. Uh, nothing else mattered to me. And we'll get into that because that, by the way, is, is not the right way to be <laughs> if you want to be a good human being, especially to your family. <clears throat> but anyway, so I start out as assembler coder. I want to be locked away. But after about two years of writing code, um, I realized that my heart would start coming really alive. I was, my heart was alive writing code, but when I really would just feel like, oh, this is awesome, is when I would talk individually to a customer that was using the code I'd written. And I was like, wow, man, I want to do more of that. So I went to my boss and this is an important message, right? When you feel something that really brings you alive, tell your boss, right? Wherever you're working. And I said to my boss, I said, man, I love actually talking to clients, not in a room full, but individually, I really like it. And he said, hey, do you want to run the beta test programs for all of our products? And I said, yes. And so about three years into my career, um, I had my first business trip um, and I was so excited. I couldn't see straight. I had to call mom and dad. Well, wow, they're paying for me to fly. They're paying for the hotel and the meals. I can't believe this. And I'll never forget it. I went to Owens Corning Fiberglass in Toledo, Ohio to meet a guy named Mike Danley. I still remember it like it was yesterday. And if you've been to Toledo, it is not the garden spot of the world, right? Uh, especially compared to where you all are. Um, but, you know, but it was so exciting to actually sit down with a client on their turf and talk through this stuff. And so I said, you know what? I want to do more of that. How do I travel and work with clients more? And they said, well, um, learn how to speak or join marketing. That's what they told me. So um, I went from being a developer. First path I took was marketing. I did product marketing for a year. And to be honest with you, as a techie, uh, it, was, it was just too lightweight for me. Uh, it, was, it was not my cup of tea after sitting in Anaheim at the conference center for the third time in that year, standing there 12 hours a day as people walked by just looking for free tchotchke, right? And stuff. I'm going, man, I think my brain has more to offer the world than this. So then I moved from development to marketing for a year to product management. And I said, well, I want to run the products and I want to decide what we build. And they said, okay, that's cool. Go ahead. And I did that for six years and had a blast. And that's when um, at IBM, where our distributed security business was very tiny, it was like a $10 million business a year. Um, that's where we started to go, wait a minute, security is going to be crucial going forward, but we're not going to build it ourselves. Let's go acquire companies. And so I made the decision in August of 1998 to make our first acquisition of a company out of Santa Cruz, actually called Dascom, that, did, uh, uh, that does access management, it's still one of our top products. Um, 22 years later. Uh, we acquired that, we did well with it, and then corporate said keep going. And so we've acquired 28 cybersecurity companies since September 1999. And we've gone from a $10 million a year business to a $3 billion a year business. And with kind of the breakup and stuff of semantic, we're actually IBM, at IBM Security, we're the largest security provider in the world now, uh, with over 9,000 people focused on cyber. Um, and so I ran the products, but then what happened is, and here's, here's your first, here's the first message for you is follow your frustrations. You're going to run into stuff all the time, even today, right? That frustrates you. And you have two choices. You can either whine about it or you can go do something about it. Right. And there is a right answer. <clears throat> so what I found in my career is that when I would get frustrated by something, then what I would do is instead of sitting around and whining about it, cause you'll find people that'll whine about it with you. Right. But then you realize that every moment you spend whining is a moment that you could have been solved at doing something to solve the problem. Um, and so I kind of kind of got programmed in to make sure that you don't whine, make sure you pick the, cho pick the choice of go to do something about it. So I was a developer, 
I wanted to get out and meet with clients more. So instead of whining about not doing it, I took a new job in marketing. Uh, in marketing, I felt like I needed a more technical job. So I followed my frustration and got a more technical job of not only running the products, but being responsible for what goes into the products. I did that for six years. And then I got frustrated that I felt like I was building the products that our sellers weren't selling. So then I moved over to my fourth career, which was sales enablement. And that's when I flew around the globe, like every week, all the time, speaking to clients, speaking to sellers, training them, getting them all excited and stuff. And then after six, seven years of that, I got frustrated that the people I was training still weren't executing well in selling. And so I moved over to sales in 2008. And I've been in sales and, and technical sales uh, since then now for what, what is it, 13 years. And that's my true love because I've been running, I've been the global vice president of our technical sales organization for, for six years now. And so I get to work with technical people all day. I get to work with clients all day, all over the globe, everywhere. And it's an absolute blast. So I've had literally, you know, depending how you count them, because if you consider sales and tech sales to be different things, because they are different communities. Um, you know, I've had five or six careers inside of the same company and it all came from doing something about my frustration instead of sitting around whining about it, right? So that that's kind of background. So I'm gonna share with you what I see is what's really important. You know, I've got uh, three big things that uh, is kind of a key to a successful cyber career. And I've managed people for, 24 years, whatever it is, and mentored many, many more than that. Um, and happy to mentor anyone at any any time, by the way. I've been doing this long enough. That's one of my uh, priorities is mentoring folks. Um, the first is the first thing that's most important, and I'm going to start with the obvious one is skills. Um, there's depending on who you who you pay attention to, there's you know, between a million and two million open jobs right now around the world in cybersecurity. And that is absolutely true. What that translates into is that nobody's got enough time or talent to address all the cyber problems they have. So all of you looking at, either if you're deep into cyber training um, or if you're considering it, I'm telling you, it's just, we need you. <laughs> the industry needs you. <laughs> we need people that are focused on this topic. It's, it's gotten so intense that we coined a phrase about two years, three years ago um, that we call new collar jobs. Cybersecurity is an area for new collar jobs, right? You have white collar, suit and tie. Uh, you have blue collar, which is kind of more, you know, workers and stuff. And then you have new collar. New collar means it's a role that is so new and so urgent the most important thing is not necessarily the degree that you have, but the skills that you have. So, for example, we'll hire people who have, you know, a business degree, but took three cyber courses and really showed an aptitude. In. You know, just for an example for you. Now, clearly, look, a computer science or a like cybersecurity degree, that's the best. I mean, you know, you can punch your ticket. I mean, as long as. When we get to numbers two and three, you'll see why you can be really good at cyber, but still not get a good job. So hang on for two and three, because it has nothing to do with your technical skill. It has to do with you. Right? But on the first one on your skills, if you got a cyber degree or something, you're going to you know, get interest from every one of us out there um, that are in this space. Um, so it's really, really important. Um, but you got to be a sponge think about this. Why is AI so popular in cybersecurity? AI is so popular combined with cybersecurity because there is so much threat intelligence being generated on a daily minute per second basis. Human beings cannot possibly keep up with all of the insight that's being generated around the globe right now. And that's not going to change. So you have to constantly be a sponge to be open to learning new things. Right now in the cyber world, we're going through that in a profound way. For the last 20 years, when you talk to cyber people, um, almost every co uh, college program out there that has cybersecurity focus, uh, almost every customer out there with a cybersecurity program, which means all of them, I have, have been based for 20 years predominantly around network security. 
Right. In fact, I was uh, talking to another university um, on a board that I'm on forum uh, yesterday that they have such a huge emphasis on network security. That's good. But guess what? <laughs> the biggest problem right now is not network security at all. The biggest problem is that most organizations are modernizing or digitally transforming to the cloud and they have agile DevOps teams cranking out workloads that are leveraging sensitive data and they're deploying them in multiple clouds and the cyber teams aren't even aware of it. Hey, right? we've, I mean, this is lit. I am not overstating this. Every client I'm walking into is struggling with this because the cyber teams have struggled for 20 years just because there's not enough people in the space and the threats keep you know evolving every day and all that stuff. And they're just trying to keep their act together with their own shop. Now you've got the modernizing, digitally transforming people around them, around what I call the cyber bubble, which is the you know, chief information security officer and all the security people in an organization. They're just trying to keep the lights on with what they know of the existing threats. They're not hooked enough in most cases to those DevOps teams that are cranking workloads with sensitive data that's being put out to hybrid multi-cloud, right? So uh, um, one of the things you'll hear about in the industry is one of the hottest things out there right now is zero trust. Well, what is zero trust? Zero trust is based on the realization that the perimeter that you need to worry about now is not just the network. The new perimeter you need to worry about is anywhere and everywhere your sensitive data is. Anywhere and everywhere your sensitive data is. So think about it as micro perimeters. Anywhere you've got sensitive data spread across multiple clouds, across your own systems, across your own devices, technically, you need to know where that stuff is and be able to form effective micro perimeters around that data. But people are struggling just to keep the perimeter around their existing shop. So you see that we've got this massive problem and there's a lot of cyber teams. This is why I'm, this is one of the points I'm making on being a sponge. You gotta constantly keep learning. Most of the clients I'm working with right now are realizing, oh my gosh, we've gotten pretty smart at least in traditional cyber. But if you tell, if you asked me what are the best practices for configuring the uh, cloud native environment with Docker containers and Kubernetes, they'd go, uh, I don't know. And if you don't know, how are you going to be influencing what cyber the modernization teams are doing, right? Cranking out new workloads for the business into the cloud. You're not, you know what that means? They're either not gonna bake security in or they're gonna do it themselves and they're not security people. So that is happening at scale right now around the globe. Everybody's modernizing. The cyber teams were struggling just to do what they were doing before, let alone understand and influence what's going on in this new world stuff. So if we are not being sponges and constantly learning the new stuff going on, then um, we're going to look dull um, really, really quickly. Let me give you another example of being a sponge. Um, you're, I assume the vast majority of you are at the age where it's like, well, duh, I mean, you know, I got to learn every day and, and that's exciting. I had my greatest career learning about well, for being honest, about seven years ago now, but I was in my, uh, I was in my late forties and, you know, you get to that age and you go, all right, I know my stuff. I've done it for a long time. Um, and then I had my greatest career learning and that career learning was this, is that there is so much that happens that's out of our control. One of the greatest things you can do as you program yourself of how you operate is to not worry for one second about things that you do not control. However, make sure that you absolutely nail the stuff you do control. I'm gonna say it again. A basic, I mean, this applies by the way in your life as well as in your cyber career. Make sure you nail the stuff that, you're, that you control, whether you show up on time whether you got enough rest to, to function, uh, whether your brain is in the right place, whether you use your time wisely, make sure you nail that stuff, even just the basics, like I just said. 
There are so many billions of things that happen that you have no control over. Don't worry for a moment about those things because all it does is waste your time. And that's another example of being a sponge, of being open to learning about how can you be more effective. Because every second you spend worrying about something that you can't control at all is a complete, it's gone, it's wasted. And you could have used that time, right, to actually do something useful, um, which, which is a big deal. So be a sponge um, and, and that's how it works. So that's the first thing is, is skills, be a sponge. And it's both technical skills around cyber as well as as a person learn how to function better. Uh, the second thing is build a mentor network. People want to know, you know, how, how do I stick out? Like, I'm going to be a newbie at this company or startup or wherever you go. I'm going to be a newbie. How do I get known? Well, the magic sauce is your mentor network. Because uh, what happens is when executives sit around, right? When I'm sitting around with my peers and we're saying, hey, we've got these three new projects and we need some, you know, fresh talent to really come and give them an opportunity. To, to you know nail it on these projects is that who are we going to consider we're going to consider the people that we've talked to that we've gotten to know that we go hey they got a lot of prompts and that's what your mentor network does for you your mentor network gives you both advice on your career on an ongoing basis and you can have careers you can have mentors in the company you're at and of course mentors outside you know your professors friends that you know in the field whatever all the, whatever it happens to be um, but what happens is the mentors will give you the voice of wisdom, right? So they've been through it. They can give you the wisdom of, of how to look at things and how to deal with things and how to learn things and all this other stuff. But then they also, as you naturally build a relationship with them, then they go vouch for you in these meetings. Uh, when, when people are saying, well, who, who should, can you think of someone that should lead, you know, this project? Oh, well, I've been mentoring um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Michael over here, and I'll tell you what, he's really impressed me. Um, I think we ought to give him a chance. That's how it happens. So build your net, uh, mentor network, both uh, inside of whoever you're working for, as well as outside uh, in the industry and academia. It's that, now, who do you choose as a mentor? I've, I've got a, a rule that I've used for a couple of decades, is that always choose mentors that are at least one level beyond the next place you want to go. And let me give you an example. Let's say um, you're working on a, uh, on a red team uh, at a company. Like our X-Force red team is, is, uh, hires a lot of college grads um, and has grown radically in the last five years. Um, and let's say you do some red teaming stuff and you really enjoy it, but you go, you know, I want to kind of, I kind of want to like, I want to kind of run the program, not just be a red hatter. Um, you know, I actually want to kind of manage the offering itself because you got kind of a more management business bent to you, right? What I would do then is I would take, I would say who manages that team of offering managers and who do they report to? And I'm going to ask that person if they'll be my mentor. And by the way, in 80% of the cases, maybe 90, when you ask someone if they would mentor you, they'll say yes, because all of us that have been doing this for any length of time love uh, to share our wisdom because we know that we can help you short circuit things that it might take you a long time to learn. We can kind of give it to you up front, right? So you don't make certain mistakes and stuff like that. So pick someone that is one level beyond where you want to go next. Well, what if, as I have a lot of conversations um, with, with younger folks is, well, what if I don't know where I want to go next? Well, then just pick something that you find interesting and then pick someone beyond that level. And uh, you generally want to have anywhere from two to four mentors. And uh, I would assert to you the most effective way to use mentors is get together every quarter, every three months. And the most important thing is, is, is this. Um, the biggest mistake I see people make when I'm mentoring them is that they will uh, show up and go, oh, cool, I'm talking to an executive. What do you want to talk about? Don't do that. Come with questions. 
come with ideas of things you're seeing that you're wondering how that mentor would handle. Because that's what you want to learn. You want to ask them tough questions. We as mentors love to be challenged. When someone gets on the line and says, oh, I'm talking to an executive. What do you want to talk about? I go, you got to be kidding me. Dude, I don't have time for that. Right? Come and ask tough questions. That's what you want to do. So that's the second thing, right? Is So uh, build a mentor network. And the third thing, and I'd assert to you, this is the most important one, is, is be humble. Be a good person first. Because <laughs> look, here's the deal. Um, you can be the smartest person in the room, but if you're the smartest person in the room that nobody really wants to work with because you're kind of, kind of a jerk about it, you may succeed for a while, but you're only going to go so far. The most important thing is to be a good person because cybersecurity is a highly collaborative place. And you want to make sure that um, people want to work with you. All right. So a couple of things and, and then I'll close. Um, I'll give you an example of, of uh, from my world of where I wasn't humble and what it almost cost me. So 1993, I'd been writing code for uh, four years. I was about to move over to marketing. I got invited uh, to speak at a conference with about 300 clients over in Brussels, Belgium. I had never been outside of the country before. Um, well, actually, other than like two hours in Tijuana on a trip when I was a kid to San Diego, but right, whatever. But so I was going to Brussels, Belgium, and I, you know, I was like thrilled. I'm like, wow, they're going to fly me to Belgium. Where the hell is Belgium? I, I didn't even know where it was on a map. Um, and I go over and I call my mom and dad and, oh, God, it's so great. And I did my session. Remember, I was terrified of talking in front of people, but I was just talking about my technology so I could crutch on that knowledge. And I actually did pretty well and I really enjoyed it. So I'm going, wow, man, I'm like having fun in Brussels. Well, then what happened is the next day was the closing keynote of this conference. And the American exec that was supposed to fly over to deliver the closing keynote had to cancel at the last minute. So the organizers of this cross European conference in Belgium came to me and they said, hey, we heard you did pretty good on your session yesterday. Would you like to deliver the closing keynote for this conference? And here I am four years into my career and they're going, wait a minute, you want me to do the closing keynote? So my brain was going, dude, you don't, it was about the future of client server computing. I had no idea what the topic was, right? I was a developer who had been there four years. I had no idea of the bigger picture of what was going on. But my pride said, well, I have a chance to do a closing keynote. Ho, ho, ho. So I said, sure. So uh, this executive sends me this PowerPoint deck, and uh, I didn't understand almost a single word in it. But I had committed, so my pride said, go ahead. So I get up in front of 300 people in this beautiful amphitheater in Little Belgium, just south of Brussels, and the lights are off. There's a spotlight on me, you know, feeling like a corporate rock star kind of thing. I can only see the th first three rows of probably about 12 to 15 rows in this massive amphitheater. And um, I got up there and I said, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I turned around and started reading the slides. <laughs> Right. And there's, you know, the anticipation for the closing keynote, what's going to happen with client server computing is very exciting. And this young geek gets up there and starts reading the slides 45 minutes into a 45 minute session for, I'm sorry, 45 seconds into a 45 minute session, a client in the front row asked me a question. So, oh, excuse me, sir, you know, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know the answer. But I'm like, well, I can't tell them I don't know the answer. We're not less than a minute into it. So I made up an answer and it was complete, complete gibberish. And all I remember at that moment was my heart sinking as I watched the first three rows, because that's all I could see because of the spotlights, everyone going like that. And I still have 44 minutes to go of this thing. So I froze up. I read for another 44 minutes. When the ratings for the conference came out, all the sessions were up here around 90 to 100% ratings. And my closing keynote was down here in, in the depths, right, of Hades. It was, it was just bad. I was so humiliated, but I walked into it because I pridefully 
took on something that I knew I was not ready for. And at that moment, I thought I'm either never going to speak in public again because I am humiliated myself in front of 300 clients, or remember, you can whine or you can do something about it. And in my case, what I did is I started taking some courses on presentation speaking and started taking opportunities to talk about stuff that I did know, know that I did know about. And when you do that, you can start growing. And now what I do is, you know, travel around the world virtually for the last year, but I'm on the phone with clients from around the globe every single day. And what I do is speak all the time. Right. So I went from what I affectionately call bombing in Brussels because <laughs> it was bad, man. <laughs> if you were there, you've been going, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to rethink my life. Um, right. But you can have a massive transformation in who you as a person. So uh, a final point I'll, I'll leave with you here is um, part of being humble is related to a really cool quote I heard, heard once. And it's this. Once you attach your personality to a proposition, people respond to the personality and not the proposition. Let me say that again. When you attach your personality to a proposition, people respond to the personality and not the proposition. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because if you're a smart cyber person, but you got an attitude about it, right? What happens is you can be talking about the most intense cyber thing out there with deep insight and half the people in the room aren't going to be paying attention to what you're saying. They're going to be paying attention that you're kind of pompous, <laughs> right? So be humble, right? Now be confident. Uh, nothing in I said means be passive or a wallflower or anything. Be confident, but be humble and, and be a good person. So be a sponge, grow your skills, build a mentor network and uh, be humble. So I thank you so much for having me on here. Team, I have no idea if we have time for Q&A and stuff, but I'm happy to stay on for a while if there are. And I'm more than happy to talk to anyone offline um, if you want to have a side conversation about careers or anything else. And uh, once again, an honor to be with you here this morning. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was really great. Yeah, uh, you know we do have time. Uh, let's do uh, one of the most requested questions. Uh, what is something you wish someone had told you when you started your career? Um. Well, the, what's funny is I realized that if they had told me this early in my career, I wouldn't have understood it. <laughs> Right. So because I just I mean, once again, I went in with a perspective that said, let me write code for 30 years. Give me a retirement check and I'll go away and a happy kind of thing. Um, the thing I wish someone had told me when I started my career is that who you are um, is going to have an even bigger impact than what you know. Right. And it kind of comes down to that last point that I shared with you guys is that, um, and, and by the way, it doesn't mean style. It doesn't mean you have to be out there speaking all the time. You can be the biggest introvert in the world who does spend most of the time behind a closed door, right? But if you're a collaborative person and if people want to work with you, whether you're that excited to you know, be out in the social situations and stuff, or if you just thrive on it and go nuts on it, is just being yourself is the most important part of this. Yes, you got to have the skills and everything, but you got to be collaborative. In fact, let me let me give you one more point on that. So th this may freak you out a little bit. So Harvard did a study uh, last year that was on what makes um, what makes a great leader. And of course, there's been a billion. I'm overstating, of course, but there's been a lot of studies over the last fifty years on what makes a great leader. But guess what this Harvard study found out? And they absolutely nailed it because they looked at 40, form, 40 prior leadership studies and did some new original research. They said, what are the characteristics of, uh, of a successful leader out there? And the answer was a successful leader is one who doubles down on who they authentically are. Now, what does that mean? What that means is if you're out there, let your freak flag fly kind of thing, right? Be the unique you. If you're a quiet introvert, then be a quiet introvert and don't feel bad about it, but be true to who you are. Now, that may sound like anticlimactic at first when you hear it, but what's the contrast? 
The contrast is that every other leadership study out there says, what are the characteristics of a great leader? And they'll pick a couple of CEOs, for example, that everybody respects and go, be like them. Well, that's what almost destroyed General Electric. 20 years ago, Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric, was widely seen as the best CEO in the universe. So guess what General Electric Company did? They built their management development program around building mini jacks. So instead of letting leaders be who they were authentically, you know, whether you're uh, you know, effusive and out there and active or quiet or whatever your style is, they were trying to train them to be like Jack. And when you're not being authentically who you are, guess what? It ain't going to work. And that almost brought General Electric down because they thought the answer was build a bunch of mini Jacks instead of build a bunch of authentic leaders who double down on who they actually are. Right. So that I would say that that's a long answer to a short question. But the point is, is that continuing to grow yourself into being a good person is as important as the cyber skills that you build. No, this is the great, great answer. You know, I, I completely agree. Uh, let's see. So we for our second uh, question, we've got about five minutes. Uh, how many uh, sorry, how important are certifications and should we actively try to get as many as possible or would it be better to be more specialized? Uh, great, great question. Um, so certifications are um, very important. And the reason is, is that as soon as you get any certification, whether it's, you know, CompTIA or one of the ISACA ones or something from SANS or whatever, once you get a certification, then that sends all of us in the industry the message that says, okay, you're really serious about this stuff, right? So um, now, but the part B of your question was great. So should you just get a list of them? No. So the, the reaction most of us have when you see someone who has eight certifications after their name is you think, dude, you got to get a life, man. <laughs> you know, it, it's like overkill. Now, and most people that do that, do that for themselves. It's not for anyone else, right? It's for themselves. But getting a few certifications, bingo, because it shows, especially when you're young in your career, it shows that you're very serious about doing this. Right. So I've gone out and I've gotten three certifications. Um, uh, I've gotten two of them from ISACA, one around risk and controls, the other, other around data privacy. And last year I got certified in the open fair model for risk quantification just because I was fascinated with it. I actually didn't need to do it. I just was like, heck, that looks hard. Let me go challenge myself. And I did it. Um, you know, but I, I, it's, well, and at my point in my career, right? And, you know, I'm in the second half of my career, so I don't need to worry about it as much, but it's more for just professional development. But for you all, you know, just even get one. And it will say a lot. And by the way, it doesn't have to be CISSP. CISSP is super geeky, drills way down, you know, all this other stuff. There are a lot of other certs that are nowhere near as, uh, let's say, deep. Um but, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't, when I get a resume and if I see someone who's young who has a CISSP, I'm going, how'd you do that? Because a lot of it is based on, you know, knowledge of like ongoing knowledge. But if I see someone with a CompTIA Security Plus, or if I see like a CISM or something for my SACA, I go, well, that's really impressive. Because to get that at your age means you really poured some heart and soul into it. Um, uh, uh, and let me give you an, uh, an alternative to a formal cert is that a lot of us out there offer open badges um, in cybersecurity. Like, for example, if you go to IBM.com slash security, we've got badges. They're free. You can take badges on certain cyber topics, and we issue through a claim a digital badge that you can attach to your LinkedIn profile. And by the way, you want to have a LinkedIn profile. A lot of us use that. And you could put that badge right on your LinkedIn profile, right? And now all of a sudden, you not only have a LinkedIn profile, but you've got this badge that's related to cybersecurity. And, and they're a lot less intense in terms of earning them. They're, you got to know your stuff, but they're less intense than a formal certification. So open badges are also relevant. And we're not the only ones. There's a number of folks in cyber 
um, that offer open badges to the public. Um, so that's another way to do it. But yeah, I mean, especially at your age, like get a couple at the most. Um, but uh, going beyond that is you wonder if uh, you do anything but get certs. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at Torac 5.0. Uh, you know, it's it's been great having you. Uh, and up next, we're going to have so many more. We're going to break out in other sessions and we're going to have other speakers come on. And again, thank you, Bob Kalka. Great to see you all. Look forward to chat again. All right. Take care. Peace.